Uh, through the chair, I would like to ask uh, a question about the tragic massacre in Orlando. Um, but I wanted to uh, lead into that um, by, first of all, thanking and deeply appreciating the work and efforts of my colleague from Connecticut, who has come to the floor so many times to talk about the lives and the identities and the legacies of the people who have lost their lives to gun violence and the families that uh, are there to remember them. And, uh, you know, I, I remember so profoundly uh, the massacre at Newtown. Um, uh, Senator Murphy f brought photographs of all of the victims, their families, told their stories at length on this Senate floor. Uh, as weeks and months persisted here in the United States Senate and no action was taken, to do common sense things to make access to these weapons more difficult. The senator from Connecticut started coming to the floor and talking about some of the people that we don't read about because the media doesn't rush to the scene when somebody dies in a drive-by shooting or in a place that doesn't garner the attention and the spotlight like the massacre and tragedy in Orlando has, has garnered by, by the national media. Um, so I, I thank um, the gentleman from Connecticut for his perseverance, and I am just so proud to join him uh, this afternoon in this insistence for action. You know, I am in such strong agreement with the senator from Connecticut about the need to close what we call the, the terror gap and strengthen our background check laws. Because what we've seen over the last weeks and certainly on Sunday, early morning is the nexus of hate and terror and easy access to weapons of war by people who should not have them. And I can't tell you how many times I have penned the words, you are in my thoughts and prayers. And I have spoken the words, you are in my heart, in my, heart, in my thoughts, in my prayers. I can't tell you how many times I've joined either in my former service in the House of Representatives or here in the United States Senate and join my colleagues for a moment of silence. Silence is not enough. Thoughts and prayers are important, but they are not enough. We have to act. And so I, I join many of my colleagues here tonight in the effort towards securing a vote. Securing a vote by this Senate on making it harder, just a little bit harder for people who hate people involved in terrorism to get a hold of weapons of war. And we have an opportunity because we have a bill before us. It's the Commerce Justice Science Appropriations Bill. I have the honor of serving on the Senate Appropriations Committee and being a member of the subcommittee. Uh, and um, this is the moment. This is the bill. And this is our opportunity. Now, I'm not saying it had this been in law a year ago, a month ago, a week ago, that this wouldn't have happened. 
but our silence is unacceptable and we must act. We are better than this as a country. Can't tell you how many times I've woken up or heard midday of another mass killing. Crowd around the television set, hungry for news, wanting to know about who perished, and who's in the hospital, and when is it enough? When are we going to act? We also, in the political world, so regrettably fall into our, I don't know what to call it, comfort zones. We, you know, let's only talk about this as a terrorist incident, or let's only talk about this as a hate crime, or let's only talk about this in terms of gun violence. This is all of the above, and we have to come together. We have to be united. We have to be strong in order to respond. I also have to speak as a member of the LGBT Q community. On Friday, this last Friday, I had the honor of going to the opening ceremonies at Milwaukee, Wisconsin's Pride Fest. They were celebrating their 30th year of Pride Fest. Uh, in preparing for what I was going to say at that opening ceremony, I, I reflected on how different things were 30 years ago in 1986. That was actually the year I was first elected to local office. And I didn't have a lot of colleagues who were in the LGBT community in America, let alone the world at that point in time. Boy, we've changed, we've seen such progress. But after celebrating the opening of Pride Fest in Milwaukee, I, I woke up on Sunday morning, as we all did, to this horrific, this horrific tragedy in Orlando. A hate crime is a crime that targets a particular audience, a particular group, in order to send terror throughout that community. Not just the victims, but all who share characteristics with the victims. And in a month, June, which is Pride Month, to usually celebrate how far we have come over oppression, over discrimination, over hate crimes, to wake up and, and see this was truly unspeakable. Um, and, and back to the legislating we do on the Senate floor, I will be supporting a number of amendments on this appropriations bill, the one that I came to ask Senator Murphy about, but additionally, uh, an amendment that would add resources to the Department of Justice to help both prevent and investigate and enforce our nation's hate crimes laws. And I, and I hope those will earn votes also. Um, I will be supporting the amendment of a colleague, Senator, from, uh, Senator Casey from Pennsylvania, uh, relating to including misdemeanor hate crimes in the list of offenses that should prohibit individuals from being able to acquire, possess weapons of war. Um, but back to our focus right now. Our focus right now is on getting a vote 
on closing the terror gap, getting a vote on making sure that background checks occur with regard to every purchase so that you can't run to, you can't be rejected uh, from purchasing a weapon and then run to the internet and purchase a weapon that way or run to a gun show and purchase a weapon that way outside of the background check system. Um, one of the things that is so important, as I started by mentioning, um, was when the senator from Connecticut came to the floor and showed the faces and read the names and told the stories of the victims of gun violence, massacres in Connecticut and in locations all over the United States. And I have been so moved as I've had the opportunity to see the media begin to share with us information about the names and the lives of the 49 victims of this hateful attack. And through the chair, I want to ask Senator Murphy a question about these 49 victims of this tragedy. Um, Luis Daniel Conde, 39 years old, and Juan P. Rivera Velasquez, 37 years old. Luis, originally from San Lorenzo, Puerto Rico, was with his loving partner, Juan P. Rivera Velasquez, at Pulse. Both men were killed in the shooting. Luis was known by his loved ones as a fun-loving person with a great sense of humor. Juan, also originally from Puerto Rico, was the owner of the magazine salon and spa in Kissimmee, Florida. Simon Andrew Carrillo Fernandez was 31, and Oscar A. Montero was 26. Simon was a manager at McDonald's who was well-loved. He was known for bringing in cakes to celebrate birthdays of each and every employee. Simon and his partner, Oscar, were killed just after returning home from vacation in Niagara Falls. Christopher Andrew Lenonen, 32 years old, and Juan Ramon Guerrero, 22 years old. Christopher Andrew, who went by Drew, was with his partner, Juan Ramon, at the time of the shooting. Both men died. Drew had a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Central Florida and founded a gay-straight alliance in his high school. Akira Monet Murray. Akira was 18 and a, a recent graduate of West Catholic Preparatory High School in Philadelphia, where she was a top student and a top athlete on the women's basketball team. She had recently signed to play at Mercyhurst College in Pennsylvania. Jean Carlos Mendez Perez was 35, and Luis Daniel Wilson Leon was 37. Jean and Luis were loving partners. Both men were killed in the shooting. The families of both men took to Facebook to share 
their love and sadness. Edward Sotomayor Jr. was 34. Edward handled brand management for Al and Chuck Travel, an agency that plans vacations for the LGBTQ community. On hearing the news of Edward's death, his boss, Al Ferguson, spent time with Edward's family at the hospital. He died while urging his partner to exit the club doors to get to safety. Leroy Valentin Fernandez. Leroy was 25 years old. He was a leasing agent at an Orlando apartment complex and a vibrant performer who loved Beyonce, Beyonce, Adele, and Jennifer Lopez. His friend described her grief, it just feels very quiet now. Rodolfo, Rodolfo Aya, Aya, 33. Rodolfo was a biologics assistant at the One Blood Donation Center, a donation center that has been working to supply blood to the survivors of the shooting. His friend described him as compassionate and said that he loved his career. Brenda Lee Marquez McCool, 49 years old. Brenda was a two-time cancer survivor and real estate agent. She was a mother of 11 and was at pulse with one of her sons for a night of dancing. Angel Luis Candelario Padro. Angel was 28. He moved to Orlando from Chicago and started a job as an ophthalmic technician only four days before the shooting. He is from Puerto Rico and described himself online as adventurous, easygoing, and responsible. Antonio Davon Brown. Antonio was a captain in the U.S. Army Reserve. He had previously been a member of the Army Officers Training Corps at Florida A&M University. He was 29. Stanley Almodovar III, age 23. Originally from Massachusetts, Stanley worked as a pharmacy technician in Claremont, Florida. Friends have been taking to social media to comment on his bubbly and down-to-earth personality. Amanda Alvear. Amanda was 25. Amanda was a beloved sister and godmother. Before the shooting, Amanda posted videos to Snapchat showing herself and a friend, Mercedes Flores, dancing and enjoying themselves at Pulse. Mercedes was another victim of the shooting. Daryl Roman Burt II, age 29. Daryl was a financial aid officer at Kaiser University and a passionate volunteer. The president of the Jacksonville JCs, which Darrell was a member of, described him as always interested in a positive impact on people's lives in the community. 
Juan Chavez Martinez, 25 years old. Juan, a Davenport resident, was known by his colleagues as a kind and loving person. Facebook lists his hometown as Huichapan, Mexico. Corey James Connell. Corey was 21 and well loved. His teachers described him as their all time favorite student. His brother took to Facebook to share his grief. The world lost an amazing soul today. God just got one of the best angels. Anthony Luis Disla. Anthony was 25. He was a graduate of the University of the Sacred Heart in Puerto Rico, Santurce, where he studied education. He was also a well-known drag artist in Orlando, performing as Alanis Laurel. Deonka Deirdre Drayton, age 32. Deonka was known as Didi and was working at Pulse when the massacre occurred, according to a family member. Senseless, her aunt wrote on Facebook, Rest in peace, Dee Dee. Know this, Auntie will miss you. Mercedes Marisol Flores. She was age 26. Mercedes was at Pulse with her friend, Amanda Alvear, when the shooting occurred. She was a student at Valencia Community College and worked at the local Target. Peter O. Gonzalez Cruz. Peter was 22. Peter worked at UPS and spent his high school years in New Jersey. On Facebook, his mother thanked everyone for reaching out and expressed deep and immense pain at the loss of her son. Miguel Angel Honorato. Miguel was 30, a resident of Apopa, Florida. Miguel worked for Fajita Mex, Mexican Catering. On Facebook, his brother wrote, I can't face the fact that my blood brother is gone. May your soul re rest in peace, brother. I love you so much. Javier Jorge Reyes was age 40. Javier of Orlando worked as a supervisor at Gucci. He was originally from Guayama, Puerto Rico, and studied at the Universidad del Sagrado Corazon, said one Facebook friend, your energy and love of life and of all things beautiful was infectious. You were one of a kind, end quote. Jason Benjamin Hosovat. Uh, Jason was 19 and an ambitious young man with many passions, computers, athletics, and photography. Jason's uncle described him as very excited about his journey. Eddie Justice. Eddie Justice was 30 years old. He was an accountant and loved to make other people smile. He was able to text his mother 
right before he died on Sunday, saying that he loved her and to call the police. Alejandro Barrios Martinez, age 21. A Cuban news source identified Alejandro and spoke with his family and friends who described him as always very positive. He was able to contact his family at Pulse before he died. Gilberto Ramon Silva Menendez, age 25. Gilberto studied healthcare management at Ana G. Mendez University and worked as a sales associate at Speedway. He was originally from Manati, Puerto Rico. KJ Morris. KJ was 37 years old. KJ was a bouncer at Pulse, known for her excellent dancing an amazing smile that could light up a room. She previously lived in Massachusetts. Luis Omar Ocasio Capo. Omar, age 20, loved to dance and dreamed of becoming a performer. He grew up in Nashville, Tennessee and worked at a local Target and Starbucks. Eric Ivan Ortiz Rivera, age 36. Originally from Puerto Rico, Eric worked at a party city and sunglasses hut. He had been married about a year, and on Sunday morning, his husband frantically called friends and family when he couldn't connect with Eric. Joel Rayon Panangua. Joel was 32 years old, loved dancing, and is remembered as humble and cheerful. He was also a religious man and attended church in winter gardens. Enrico L. Rios, Jr., age 25. Enrique was from Brooklyn, New York, and he was vacationing in Orlando at the time of the attack. He'd been working as a coordinator at True Care Home Health Care and studied social work at St. Francis College. His mother and her family has been torn apart. Javier Emmanuel Serrano Rosado. Javier was 35 years old. He was the father of a young son and worked as an entertainer at Splash Bar in Panama City Beach, Florida. He was a mentor to many of his coworkers who described him as quick with a smile. Shane Evan Tomlinson, age 33. Shane was a gifted singer who performed as the front man for the band Frequency. He had a vibrant and charismatic stage presence and was at Pulse following a performance at a local club. Martin Benitez Torres. Martin was 33 years old and from San Juan, Puerto Rico, where he studied at the Ana G. Mendez University System. He was in Orlando visiting family. Frankie Jimmy de Jesus Velasquez, age 50. Frankie was a visual, visual merchandiser at Forever 21 and studied at Inter-American University in Puerto Rico. His family took to Facebook to share their love of Frankie, saying, what happened in Orlando affects all of us because it is 
an act of hate against the freedom to be who you are. Luis S. Vielma. Luis was 22, a student at Seminole State College and worked as an operator for Universal Studios, Harry Potter, and the Forbidden Journey Ride. Gerald Arthur Wright. Gerald was 31 and was employed at Walt Disney World and was well loved by both of his families, his biological one and his Disney family. He was at Pulse to celebrate a friend's birthday. Tevin Eugene Crosby. Tevin was a Michigan native and 25 years old. He was the ambitious owner of Total Entrepreneur's Concepts. He was visiting Orlando after traveling to watch his nieces and nephews graduate. Jonathan Antonio Camoy Vega. Jonathan was 24 and worked for a Spanish TV network as a producer of a popular children's talent competition. He was a member of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists in Puerto Rico before he moved to Florida. Jean Carlos Nieves Rodriguez was 27, a manager at a local McDonald's. He was known for being incredibly dependable. His closest friends describe him as just a caring, loving guy, just like a big teddy bear. You'll marry Rodriguez Sullivan, age 24. You'll marry was a wife, a sister, and mother of two sons, Yariel and Sergio. Her sister described her as the most loving and caring person you could ever meet saying her smile lit up the room and her laughter brought a smile to your heart. Frankie Hernandez Escalante. Frankie was a loving big brother who taught his little sisters how to walk in heels and do their hair and makeup. Frankie has a tattoo on his upper right arm, reading, Love Has No Gender. And Frankie moved to Orlando from Louisiana. Enrique L. Rios, Jr., age 25. Enrique, from Brooklyn, New York, was vacationing in Orlando at the time of the attack. He'd been working as a coordinator at True Care, home health care, and studied social work at St. Francis College. His mother describes that their family has been torn apart. There are three more names that I will read and tell you just a little bit about who lost their lives in that massacre on early Sunday morning in Orlando. Paul Terrell Henry was 41, and Paul was planning to return to college. He was a Chicago native and loved dancing and playing pool. He had two children, including a daughter who had just graduated from high school. Christopher Joseph Sanfiles, 
24. Christopher worked at a local bank and was known for having a positive outlook on life. He was very close to his family and told family members earlier in the weekend that he planned to go to Pulse with friends. Geraldo A. Ortiz Jimenez, age 25. Geraldo, known as Drake Ortiz, to his closest friend, was originally from Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic and studied law at the Universidad del Este in Carolina. Now, uh, through the chair, I'd like to ask Senator Murphy a question about the 45 victims of this tragedy. Senator, as someone who has come to this floor, read the names, shared the images, and told the stories of so many in our country who have lost their lives to gun violence, you agree that the time to act is now, and our thoughts and prayers for their deaths are important, but not enough. I thank the senator for the time she's taken to talk about each of these beautiful individuals, these young men and women who went to a dance club to celebrate their lives and their friends and Pride Month and who will never, ever walk the face of this earth again. Their friends and family will never get to celebrate these individuals' lives. And it's a reminder as you talk about who these people are individually, that as much as we talk about statistics, the 30,000 who die every year, the 80 a day, that this is about these lives. And that you could tell the story for each one of them of 20 other people whose lives will never be the same because of this tragedy. And you could put nearly two of those charts up every single day. And that's what's so scary, Senator Baldwin, is that we are fixated on this tragedy because of its uniqueness and its horrificness. But you could put up that chart every other day. And it's important to tell their stories, to tell who they were, because hopefully that's part of the imperative for us to act. Thank you, Senator Baldwin. 